The following programming is sponsored by Tom Tool III. The views expressed do not necessarily reflect the views of this station, its management, or Beasley Media Group. Good afternoon, greater Philadelphia area. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time and she's Stacey Mitchell. We've got Gabe behind the camera and we all work at the Tom Tool Sales Group with Remax Mainline, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we've got some interesting stuff happening today. We've got a guest coming on later, Doug Kahn from Unruh Turner, Burke and Freeze. He's an amazing estate attorney that'll help us walk you through why it's important to get your estate in order when you own real estate, which I think a lot of people kind of forget about and space on. But first, this story to me is the biggest story in real estate that nobody is talking about. And I get the feeling a lot of agents have no clue this is even happening right now. What do you two think? <laughs> well, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago. I, I know you two do, but what's uh, do, do you hear agents talking about it? Oh gosh, it? No, 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 absolutely not. And 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 the story's this: uh, that the appeals court, um, and this is regarding the NAR, one of the one of the two federal commission lawsuits that could potentially change the way real estate is done. Um, one of them, the appeals court denied NAR's petition to challenge its certification as a class action lawsuit so what that means is that this thing's moving forward and it's headed to trial in february of 2023 and for the the people out there don't know what a class action lawsuit is i think it's important to kind of explain this because i don't know that the lay person gets that so a class action lawsuit uh and this is basically Um, It's a civil lawsuit brought on behalf of a group of people or business entities who have suffered common injuries as a result of the defendant's conduct with at least one individual or entity acting as a representative of that group. And the background on this lawsuit is that there are sellers out there that have named like all the major real estate firms like KW, Remax, you name them, they're there, Berkshire Hathaway, all of them. Uh, that they unfairly paid commissions out to buyer agents because they felt it was a forced cooperation to pay those commissions. So th- this thing is is continuing to move on here. And I get worried that realtors aren't getting ready for what could happen post-lawsuit because th- they're going to do what they do here. Uh, what do you think about all this? Is this actually going to go to trial is my first question. How do you see this playing out? Because February 2023, I mean, we're looking at like six, eight months down the line here. What do you two think? I think it'll probably go to trial (laughs) because I think, I mean, these, especially if now there, there's probably going to be more people that join the class action lawsuit. Um, But honestly, it still boggles my brain. Like where, if they, if it goes to trial, just say, and they're awarded damages, where does that money come from? That's what I can't wrap my head around. This right. has already paid out commissions. Right. So how how do they do a grab back or claw back or whatever you call it? I mean, I, I don't have the answer. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, this is this is stuff for the attorneys to figure out. And we can maybe yeah. do a little research here based on on precedent. Mm-hmm. Um, so you think it's going to go to trial. Tell me more about that. What's 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 your your take on that? Because this was what well, people forget. This was negotiated and settled. Mm-hmm. And. They, uh, if you look at uh, some of the information from last year, because this this all happened last year, right after the election, where this was settled, there was a couple things that NAR was going to do. Uh, specifically, they were going to uh, prohibit MLSs that are affiliated with NAR from disclosing to prospective buyers um, the commission that the buyer broker will earn, um, allowing buyer brokers to misrepresent that the services are free, which to me is asinine because somebody's paying that. Um, enabling the filtering feature based on commissions being paid out and limiting access to uh, lockboxes, specifically the electronic lockboxes. Those were like the four things, which I thought was, it's all fine to me. I'm like, great, sounds it's good. Kind of basic, right. yeah. But then all of a sudden they said, well, wait a minute, we're going to actually right. pull this back, which is kind of unprecedented. So what, what, do, you, what do you guys think this is going to happen here? Because this was, this was like kind of said and done, and then all of a sudden this came back, and, and you know, I'm clear it has to do with the new administration and – targeting the real estate industry because they have different views than the previous administration. So and are we going to see a trial here? 
Well, now <laughs> there is uh, some midterm elections coming up too. So, <laughs> good point, I, I mean, good honestly, point. that could have something to, you know, that could change the trajectory of, of the uh, trial. Um, so, yeah, so we'll have to definitely watch that. But, uh, yeah, I, I didn't think that it would, um, you know, I didn't think that it would go this, this way. I didn't think it would go to trial. I thought that that was going to be it. It was next. It right. was done. Over. Yeah, I mean, I think that since it's gone this far through the process, um, I'd say the likelihood of it getting to trial trial is, you know, more likely now than it had been before. Um, so I I do think it'll go to trial. Um, but I, I absolutely agree with Stacey here for if they're awarded anything, like, where is that coming from? Like, that's – it's a done deal. Like, and all party – like – this was signed off on like whether or not people felt as though their their hands were tied they weren't and um you know they entered into these listing contracts with all of this information laid out for them um and they could have you know either interviewed other agents and if they were getting the same numbers then you know okay but it's you know they could have gone in and tried to negotiate that out um there's things that they could have done at the time that now that time frame is passed. Like, I don't know how you go back and say, hey, actually, I'm not cool with that, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I- it is clear. The contracts are very clear. Right. And, like, you've already at this point used their services mm-hmm. that if, you, if you're if you entering this lawsuit because you felt as though you had paid more, clearly the transaction went through. So, like, the job's been done. It's kind of like when we um, talk to different clients of ours and when you're talking about inspections and you're kind of breaking down costs and you're like you know if you elect to do inspections and the inspector comes out and then you end up terminating the deal the money that you paid for the inspector you don't get back like that's they did their job that portion is done they did what they right. needed to do so um regardless of what you do moving forward in the transaction like you're you're paying that so with this right. it's like it, it's been done so I, I looked up some information about class action lawsuits, and uh, it, they're all different, so it doesn't, doesn't help. Um, but in 1998, there was the tobacco settlements, right? That was mm-hmm. a very big one. And Philip Morris, R.J. Reynolds, and two other tobacco companies agreed to the settlement, and they covered the medical costs for the smoking-related illnesses. So I would imagine the reason these big companies are named is because they actually have mm-hmm. the money. Right. Like their balance sheet will allow for them to pay back the, the damages. Now, I don't know what the damage is going to be, where th- this lawsuit, and, and we said this before, um, and Sarah, you, you, you explained it perfectly. This was disclosed. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, I, all I can speak of is Pennsylvania contracts because I know these are in different states sure. too. But Pennsylvania says this is how much is going to this agent. It doesn't say it has to be this much. There's no, no, no thing like that in there. Now, what I found interesting was in this, um, in this suit, what, the, what they talk about here, and it kind of – piggybacked off a subpoena from KW and Rex, which is uh, Keller Williams and Rex, where they, they have like some commission scripts in there. And we can't really talk about commissions, but what they, they, and I've seen these scripts. So it's about like, can you reduce your commission script? And then it explains how that all works. I'm not going to go through the script and they kind of explain it. Um, so, and, 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 you know, uh, Sitzer Burnett in April, they, uh, they did ask for uh, that they, they did win a class action lawsuit um, after the oral arguments, um, and, and you know obviously it's getting appealed. It hasn't hasn't happened yet, so that's why these major companies are being named. I don't think there's any question here. And what what I would envision happening is this: there's probably going to be the, the the you know we have PAR standard contracts. We're very lucky to have those. We don't have attorneys doing all this stuff. It makes life easier. It also makes sure that uh, Arizona emissions insurance applies, right? So that that's very helpful and. What happens there is that it's going to say, do you want to pay a buyer agent, yes or no? And there's going to be like a box that gets checked. And then I'm paying them in addition to the fee I've negotiated with the listing agent. I would imagine that's what's going to happen. So it's just super, super clear because some buyers, they want representation. They don't just want to go to the seller. Now, the flip side is I think you're going to see more people go directly to listing agents. And this could cause some some problems with buyer agency and the buyer, I mean, they, they barely have the money to pay these things. I mean, some buyers get in barely by the skin of their teeth when they're buying a property. So to me, this is actually going to hurt sellers more than anything else if this continues to push forward. And 
you know, that's where I, I think that this lawsuit's pretty misguided in in, in my view. Um, I, I don't I don't know what your take is, but you know, letting letting a buyer try to navigate the housing market on their own right. and like make offer. I mean, there's a reason why people hire realtors, they and there's always the people that think they know better. I'm not saying or always or better. they can do it on their own. I, I think there are folks that do that. We've seen that the majority of the population doesn't have the experience there. So to me, this is going to hurt the consumer more than anything else. And this idea that commissions are not negotiable, I don't know where anyone gets that from because I don't know about you two, we get hit with this stuff all the time. Mm -hmm. Sure. Everything in real estate is negotiable, right? (laughs) Right, right. (laughs) For the most part. So, but yeah, I think it's definitely going to hurt both sides, the consumer, the seller and the buyer. You know, I think both sides. And basically, isn't, isn't this making like full circle, like, you know, buyer's representation came about because of the the possible... Well, it used you know, to not exist, yeah. Right. There used to be buyer beware. Is, right, and this is how the buyer's agency representation kind of started. Sure. Because of the dual agency, you know, was uh, mis- <laughs> misused right. or abused. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and I don't, personally, myself, I don't like to be put in that situation because I know how it feels. So if it's something that's going to happen more frequently, um, and I do think it's going to hurt the consumer in the, in the end, mostly. Well, and even down to as you're reviewing offers, you know, if you're you're seeing other people's offers coming in. And so if you're like dual agent, then like even just from the, the get go, it, it creates, you know, Potential conflict. Potential conflicts. I mean, just (laughs) from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and then once you're in it, then obviously there's there's conflicts throughout the the whole transaction. So it's mm -hmm. well, it's the hey, Sarah, don't tell the buyer this, even though I know you're representing both sides. Here's what we're willing to do, but we want to negotiate this way. And it's I mean, Mm -hmm. it's these are conversations that happen all the time. Like, hey, we're willing to go to X, but try Y first. Let's try to save some money here. That's a problem. Right. Slippery slope there. Very, very slippery. <laughs> so, so Stacy, you think this is going to go to trial, Sarah? What about you? I think that it will. Now that it's it's gotten this far and it's been, you know, they've tried to stop it a couple times and it's it's still at this point moving forward. So let me give you some statistics. Ninety-seven percent of cases settle, according to the American Judges Association. Now, obviously, this did settle and then they repealed it. And in 2021, there were 87 class action lawsuits that settled. Now, unfortunately, you don't have like a how many were filed because they last so long. The average length of a class action lawsuit is 2.6 years. Wow. That's a long time. Well, I mean, this has been going on for, I mean, we're going into year three if it goes to trial in February. I mean, so it's kind of on pace for that. Mm -hmm. And the, the, again, the issues that have come up um, and what NAR said back in, uh, this was July 5th of last year. So happy Independence Day, everybody. Um, NAR fulfilled their obligations under the settlement agreement, and now the DOJ is backing out. And NAR feels that they're, um, if the department does not live up to its commitments under the terms of the agreement, we are confident in our pro-consumer and pro-competition policies. Um, what the DOJ said they want to do to refresh everyone's memory is to perform a broader investigation into NAR's rules. So um, what what DOJ said, the proposed settlement will not sufficiently protect the antitrust division's ability to pursue future claims against NAR. And this was according to the acting assistant attorney general, Richard Powers, and real estate is central to the American economy and consumers pay billions of dollars in real estate commissions every year. We cannot be bound by a settlement that prevents our ability to protect competition in a market that profoundly affects America's financial well-being. So, I mean, this and then you have this this whole Rex thing where, you know, this is like a new wrinkle where um, what Rex had said is that and, and this is all kind of related here. So Rex was suing like Zillow and Keller Williams and all these other other places and. Keller Williams has now issued a subpoena to the discount brokerage Rex to produce the audio recordings in the multi-billion dollar class action case over commissions. And they received that permission from the U.S. District Court of uh, the Western District of Missouri to after the because they apparently they only gave like certain records in this file. It was stuff that made mm-hmm. KW look bad is kind of my interpretation of this. And they wanted everything because they were pulling it out of context. So, right. I mean, is... I, I guess, the, you know, the thing we need to think about here, I mean, so this all goes on. Let's say this goes to trial. You guys think it's going to go to trial. I, 
you know, I, I kind of see the writing on the wall here. If they would have settled, they probably would have done that by now, especially NAR is probably a little upset that they, they didn't settle the first time. Um, and so are there any other changes that you envision getting made to the proposed settlement terms if, if something happens here and this goes to trial? Or, or is it actually, are there going to be monetary awards? Like, well, how do you think this plays out? I, I guess if there were to be monetary awards, it would have to come from, you know, the the large, like, companies. Like, there's no way that they could get it back from from the individuals. Right. Um, but. And then for, who does it go to? Right. Each individual person in the, well, the majority to the. Well, attorneys. that's usually how it works, though. Yeah. They do they do send out checks in these class action right. lawsuits. I mean, if and, and there's some historic, like the tobacco one is obviously like a classic example where they, anyone that was ill, they, they sent checks to. So Right. And yeah. then I guess, would they be individually looking into each one of the cases and it would be a percent, like they take the whole amount that they get back and then I guess would have to divide it up by how much this person's home sold for and how much they pay. Like, I think it's just a flat, like how many people are involved in it. Well, the lawyers get the majority of it right off the top. So, and then you're left with it just a little bit. So, and then they divvy it up between how many people are actually in the class action law. Okay. Yeah. Equally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I don't think they go, they don't go by. Okay. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. Um, What's also interesting. So, you know, in Missouri, are they, I'm guessing that's not like an attorney review state. I don't know. Because then, like, if you're going to go after, like, this side of it, well, why not go after the lawyers and, like, argue against those fees? And then the lawyers would probably come back saying they do different levels of service. And it's like, well, that's the same for uh, why you charge different rates on on the listing side. Because you provide different levels of service and do, you know, more. <laughs> so so, they, so uh, Missouri is not an, an uh, attorney re- review state with any sort of mandated physical presence of an attorney involved in a real estate closing. Doesn't mean they don't show up. Okay. But that's, uh, that's what I was able to find here. So. Okay. There could be more to this than what meets the eye. <laughs> yeah. That's what I think. I think this is super political. Yeah. I mean, it, you know, and now at, at the same time, real estate hasn't been regulated. And, I, you know, for every – all. I know we feel a certain way about this because we do business in a very ethical manner. We follow the code of ethics. We follow the laws. Think about how many times the the realtors don't do that sort of stuff, or there's some sort of like irresponsible thing going on. And it's no different than the accounting businesses back in the you know late '90s, early 2000s. So I I don't think it's any any different there. Um, What I anticipate happening is this: I think this is going to go to trial. I think they're going to settle it, and I would imagine if you're an agent. And it, and this is for any. I think this is good advice for any realtor out there. If you don't know how to pitch your services and explain why you're worth the fee, you might as well just don't renew your license because that's what's going to happen here. I think that's the writing on the wall is that so many of these agents, especially on the purchase side, they just literally show up and sometimes and, and, and sometimes this happens because you're a good agent, but they literally just show up and okay, here's the house. I'm going to send you the paperwork electronically. Let me know. And that's kind of that's kind of how it goes. So. Those people are the ones that are in the most trouble and the folks that don't know how to communicate their value as an agent and explain, hey, so here's how the process works. Here's how I can help you negotiate. Here's how I can do all these things. Because there's always that sort of consumer out there that wants to represent themselves in court. They want to go with legal Zoom. They want to do TurboTax, use a discount. I think you're going to see a little more of that. And there's going to be some folks that realize they need, they need a real order to navigate the market. But the agents need to be more cognizant of how to communicate that. I totally agree. agree. Mm -hmm. 100%. Some type of representation. Could it be that maybe the the attorneys are trying to weed out (laughs) the the real estate (laughs) agents? Because then the attorneys would probably have, you know, represent the buyers uh, in more transactions. Sure. Because I would, I mean, most buyers have no clue what's going on. They have Mm -hmm. no idea. They've, you know, what, even if they've been through the process before, it's not something that you, deeply retain because right. it's such a wonderful experience. You know? <laughs> so, you know, they don't, people don't retain that. Right. And first time home buyers really have no clue. Right. So you need somebody who's going to sit down with you and go through the entire process. For um, sure. So you need representation for sure. That's going to, you know, work for you 110%, not represent both sides. Right. And I mean, let's say you are like, an individual that somehow does retain everything and is able to remember everything. 
what is the likelihood? Who, who is this mystery person you speak <laughs> who of? Who are you? Um, but what is the likelihood that your next real estate transaction is going to go exactly the way your first one went and that the market is still the exact same and that like you could just do it all exactly the same? This is something that's mm-hmm. always changing and you have to know what's going on right now. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, I mm-hmm. that's a good point. Like you're Sarah. not doing yourself any favors. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. And that's well said. So, I mean, I, if I was an, if I was a real estate agent, I'd be taking, I mean, I am. Um, <laughs> for all the realtors listening out there, I'd be taking note of this suit and understand not only is this happening, there's also major tech disruption, and there's also a shifting market. And if you are not working on your skills right now as a real estate agent and focusing on those income-producing activities, communicating value, and finding clients that are going to value you, and that's probably as important as anything else, then you're going to be in for a rude awakening in the next 12 to 24 months as this stuff continues to happen because the market's going to continue to shift. This lawsuit's going to progress, and there's going to be more and more people trying to come at your piece of your earnings, which is what's happening with a lot of different companies right now. Mm-hmm. Yep, yeah. coming from all sides. Yeah. Well, well, well said, Stace. <laughs> so we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back, and we are going to talk about – the labor shortage and the labor shortage's impact on the real estate industry, which is pretty wild when you look at the reaction here. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. Buying a home or already own one? We can help. I am Kevin Hamill from Alliances Insurance Agency. If you haven't reviewed your policies in the last three years, now's the time. New home buyers, there are a number of ways that we can help you get to that settlement table. Call us to find out more at 610-816-0043, extension 3, or visit our website, alliancesinsurance.com. Don't forget the S, it's for savings. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. I'm Tom Tool of the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline. If you're thinking of becoming a real estate agent in the greater Philly area, I have a special offer for you. Our team did $165 million of volume in 2021, making us the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania and a top 1% team nationally. Our agents love us because we offer them a successful career, a great life, and an unbeatable culture. Agents who've been with us for at least a year average 30-plus sales. Even our brand-new agents average 17 to 24 sales a year. We offer proven systems and expert training. We help you set more appointments and sell more houses. Now, here's the offer. If you don't have a real estate license yet, we offer real estate scholarships so you can get one for free. Check it out at realestatescholarshipprogram.com or visit the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline at tomtool.com. That's tomtoolwithane.com. Get more out of your real estate career and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. For the best local mortgage service and great rates on your money, look no further than Mortgage America. We've been operating in the greater Philadelphia area for 40 years with a focus on smooth, easy access to home purchasing. Whether you're a first-time buyer, upsizing or downsizing, or just refinancing, we have programs for you. We also have closing cost assistance programs and access to subsidized interest rates. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. To learn more, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. We always have a person available to take your call with around-the-clock human service. Purchase your home with the personalized local service you find at Mortgage America. Mortgage America is an equal housing lender, NMLS 128501. Welcome back to Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Stacy Mitchell. She's Sarah Timon. We got Gabe behind the camera, and we all work with the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Mainline, the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we've got an interesting story here about the economics, about what's going on, the labor shortage, and we've got our guest, Doug Kahn, walking in right now. So, Doug, feel free to jump in as we're talking here. And we're going to talk all about his firm, his business. He's one of the best estate attorneys I've ever seen. So we're excited to jump on that here in the third segment. But first, the labor shortage and the impact on real estate is kind of mind-blowing when you look at what's happened here. Because 
When you guys hear labor shortage, what do you think the initial reaction or the initial effect would be on the real estate market? Negative. Negative. Mm -hmm. Tell me more, Sarah. I mean, give us some give us some details here. Like when you hear that, what's negative about it? Is it about building? Is it about demand, supply? Tell us more. Um, I guess like a combination of of all of it, just how both the supply would be, you know, hard to to keep up with Um, slowdowns of, yeah, of, of work in progress and just different delays. I think I think that's what a lot of people think. Right. Yeah. What's happening, though, and this this is the, always the interesting thing, is that unemployment, it's come down pretty, pretty dramatically since the peak of the pandemic into the three point six percent range out as of May 2022. And when you see unemployment that low um, and it's considered full employment when the unemployment rate is in the four to five percent range, so we actually have exceeded that at this point. And this labor shortage, while it's hurt supply chain and building and renovations and all these other things. Um, what the Realtor.com chief economist Danielle Hale pointed out is that the economy is now just 822,000 jobs shy of the pre-pandemic high mark. And what it's done is it's actually boosted demand. And ca- even though there's all these inventory issues, like everyone thinks the demand's going to slow down, it just hasn't happened. Mm-mm. And now we're at this point where we see inventory coming up a little bit, not much. I mean, we're talking you know very small numbers. And the labor shortage with a lot of people think would, would hurt real estate. It's actually increased the market more dramatically. And I would say more dramatically in a city like Philadelphia and a market like here where there's not a lot of new construction. So do we see this changing anytime soon? I mean, this is, this is just, it's, it's very contradictory to what you would think or a logical person would think without actually looking at the data. And Doug, if you got anything, feel free to let us know. All right. Thanks. Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everybody's been waiting for something to change. I hear this all the time from people. I heard it today like three times already. Well, we're waiting for the market to crash. Mm-hmm. You know, that's the that's the big buzzword. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, you know, we're waiting for it to cool off. That's the other one. Um, but folks have been waiting for it to cool off since basically 2020, yep. since we were able to open the doors. Um, and it hasn't. And I honestly don't see, I can't see that happening in the future just by being in the business and know what we go through on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. And you're still seeing homes get under contract so quickly. Now, there's some that are sitting a little bit longer, 7, 14 days. Um, but typically, they're either overpriced to begin with or, um, you know, maybe it has some type of defect that some buyers aren't willing to cope sure. with. But I have not seen this. And it, it does say that in the real estate sector, um, the unemployment ranks grew about 14,000 mm-hmm. people in May. And the home builders and residential contractors added about 16,700 jobs in May. That's a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I mean, I don't hear so much about the supply chain issues as, as we did before. Mm-hmm. There's some things still backordered, like cabinets and stuff. But I think things are starting to pick up a little bit. And they're not as severe. Um, so, but... In those unemployment numbers that we hear about all the time, there's so many folks that just completely dropped out of the market, of the job market. They just dropped out. So they're not folks being included in that number. So I don't know how accurate that number is. That's a really great point because there are people that have yeah. just they stopped just working. Stopped. Like, I mean, yeah. and, you know, people got promoted or their, maybe their spouse got a, got a, you know, got a raise that, that made it unnecessary for both of them to work, mm-hmm. which has happened a lot because hiring has been so tough mm-hmm. and it's more costly hiring people right now and finding the right people for jobs. That's a great point, Stace. So I think with that number, we don't really know the true unemployment rate, really, because those folks that dropped out, they dropped off the roster of that number. So and they're weeded out all the time. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, when you go into the service industry, you're going to see that. You're going to feel the mm-hmm. effects. Yeah. Um, but I know a lot of young people, if they were living on their own, they move back home and they might not be working. So there's a lot of, you know, a lot of different situations that are behind the scenes in these numbers. Well, Lauren June said, the chief economist of NAR, that um, he made a, a very similar point about just, just the industry very broadly that could have longer term impacts on how accessible homes homes are because the housing shortage, we know it exists. More workers are needed and, you know, they have to get hired at higher wages. So it's causing, you know, profits drop for builders and, you know, the engineering costs are up. There, there's a lot of things that have inflated. And because of that, you know, and, and with the labor market being really tight in construction um, and that that's actually has a they have a higher unemployment rate. Like you said, it's a five point six percent job open rate in April. 
uh, the, what a lot of people are saying is that all this leads to speculation of the economic recession that's coming. And what does that mean for housing? And I think that that's where there's a little bit of concern and uncertainty right now. So when you say you have people saying they're, they want to wait, and Sarah, I don't know if you're hearing this too, mm-hmm. is it around the uncertainty in the economy? Is it around available inventory? What, what are they citing specifically? Because I know rates have come up. There's been a lot of reasons people are just kind of pumping the brakes a little bit right now. It hasn't been because of the potential recession around the corner. Um, it's more so the inventory. Mm-hmm. They're frustrated, the multiple offer situations. They feel that if they wait another year, it'll be a different situation. <laughs> it will be a different situation. Interest rates you know, are going to be higher. <laughs> um, but I still believe you're still going to have competition because the inventory is not going to dramatically increase to a normal market, which is six months. I mean, what did it go up to? What are we up to, like a month and a half possibly? Uh, I mean, it's, so it, it kind of varies. I mean, we, we don't uh, – in the month of uh, April, we're getting the May data any day now. Um, we saw like a three-quarters of a month supply in Chester, Delaware, Montgomery counties, and Bucks. Philadelphia, it's more like a month and a half. Okay. And it, it's a little bit of a different market in the city. Yeah. So, I mean, those numbers are – and now what we also saw, though, starting in March, is that new listings, the number of new listings that hit the market – we're more than the number of homes going under contract. So it's got to start there for mm-hmm. supply to build up. And I would look at, like, after 4th of July, like mm-hmm. July, August, September, because we didn't really have a seasonal market the past two years. It was just go, go, go. I would anticipate this year now that, like, people are having, like, graduations again, like you're seeing a return to normalcy, like there's part – like it, everyone's kind of over the – I wouldn't say everyone's over it, but they're more comfortable mm-hmm. living a, a normal life. We're going to see people take more vacations, mm-hmm. and there's going to be more seasonality there. So – I don't think you can really use the spring market as a barometer for what's happening. I think you got to kind of wait until that, like, August is a tough month in real estate. Like, everyone's on vacation. It's slower. You got back to school. That's going to tell the story probably more than anything else. That That's at least my observation and what I think is going to happen. Yeah, I think that makes sense. So Eve, let's say there is a recession. So, mm-hmm. and I think this comes up a lot. Like, I mean, the housing market, I think people are just concerned and – I don't think realtors have gotten real with the fact that inventory is not coming up, even though it's starting to outpace things. And prices, they're not predicted to go down. And I think it's important to point out the history of recessions in the country related to the housing market. So if you go back to 1980, and let's call it there's been six recessions since then, 1980, 1981, 91, 2001, 2008, and 2020, all different lengths and everything else. Housing prices, if you take 2008 out of it, because that was a clearly like a lending failure, you know, you had a pulse, like here was your loan. It was con- no doc loans, right? What's your income? Sounds great. That's kind of what was going on. Um, you take that out. How- prices only went down once, and they only went down 1.9%, so less than 2% in all of those recessions. So for the folks that are telling you they want to wait because of inventory, like what are the conversations you guys are having? Because I, I think people, they-, they try to outthink the market and – I don't think you can time the market. No one ever knows. I mean, you can maybe see the headwinds coming, but usually it's like too late. Like you can try to time it after it starts going the other way. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, I think when when people talk about um, inventory, we know that even with, uh, you know, some of these outside factors like interest rates changing and that potentially having some people fall away, there are more buyers than there is inventory to get. So even if inventory picks up a tick, um, I think that will either – pull a couple more buyers that have been on the fence, like back into the game. Um, or even if, even if they don't come back in, I mean, there's, you know, there's, there's not going to be enough inventory to make it to where it's all of a sudden a super favorable time for you as a buyer to like go in and like, Oh, now everything's, you know, on my end, you know, I think it's, it's going to be the same situation down the road. So if you're if you're paying rent and you're you're waiting, well then you're just spending that much more time paying rent to still be in the same situation down the road. There's always new buyers coming into the market too Great point. for different reasons. I mean, people are changing jobs and life changes, you know. So they're they're coming into the market all the time. And we've seen an influx and I still see an influx of of people coming from the cities, from New York, from North Jersey, mm-hmm. they're coming to the suburbs, you know, and even from Philly, they're coming mm-hmm. out. So um, that has not really changed in, in the past year. That That's not what I'm seeing. You know, I'm still seeing that. So I don't see where we're going to make up for all this. I don't see if we were going to have that big uh, construction push, we already did. Mm-hmm. 
new construction push. Mm -hmm. um, it's not enough inventory to make up for all the buyers that we have. It, the millennials have infiltrated <laughs> the market mm -hmm. and they'll be infiltrating for the next five years or so. I mean, because if they're not going to find a house this year or next year, you know, eventually they'll still be in the market. Right. And we have to contend with that major population. Well, and even, I mean, I've been through 2008. We obviously have been through 2020, and, and we still saw people buy and sell homes. I mm -hmm. think that's the myth that people have, that maybe the smart, like, investor or the smart buyer, they kind of look at it and they say, well, here's an opportunity here. I've been kind of waiting for this because when there's less competition buying, that's kind of when you want to buy versus what we went through the past 24 months where you're writing, 50, there's 15 offers in on a home, and they're all waived cash offers, mm -hmm. which is just mind-blowing to me. So... One thing I wanted to touch on here real quick, and then we're going to get to Doug and, and talk all about uh, how, how that's so critical to real estate and just in general in life with, you know, having your, your, your ducks in a row here, especially when it comes to your, your estate and your personal life. Uh, Logan Matashami from Housing Wire, he has six recession red flags. And he says that, and look, he's an economist. He, Housing Wire is obviously a very big outfit. He says until all six are up, we're not in a recession. So I'm going to go down these with you one by one. And we can all agree that the market's decelerating right now. It was not sustainable the past 24 months. So unemployment goes to 4%. Um, and he calls this a progression red flag, meaning the economic ex expansion is more mature. So obviously we saw unemployment is, is, in, is in that range. The Federal Reserve starts to raise rates. Check, right? We all know about that. The inverted yield curve. So if you don't know what this means, let me break it down because this is some heavy economic stuff. It's... Um, he had uh, he, what he calls an inverted yield curve. It's when the two-year yield and the 10-year yield, and these are treasury bonds, they actually meet in their, uh, in, in their graphs where they kind of high-five and say hi to each other. Um, and that's another progression red flag that, that's up because we saw that the yield on the 10-year went to like 1.94%. So it kind of all, all met that there. Find the overheating economic sector where demand can't be sustained. You want to guess what that is? Hmm. I don't know. <laughs> so um, they, they actually, so housing is one. Uh, they call it durable goods data, and uh, a few companies are laying off people or putting on a hiring freeze. So once the demand comes back to normal, people start to get laid off. And we've seen a lot of real estate companies lay people off recently. I mm -hmm. think that, that, I mean, that's like every time I look at CNBC, like they're like, I mean, it's, it's mortgage companies, you know, Better just had another round of layoffs. We've seen some of the... Um, KW just got rid of their like acting president. Now Gary Keller's back in charge. We're seeing that these things are starting to happen without going through all the companies. Um, here's one that's not up. Uh, new home sales, housing starts, and permits fall into a recession. So um, once rates go up, the new home sale sector typically does get hit harder than the existing sales. Um, however, we, we haven't really seen that happen yet because people are looking at new construction as like an alternative because they can't find an existing mm -hmm. home. Less competition. Um, so that's been something that, that really hasn't happened yet. And lastly, leading economic index uh, declines four to six months before recession. So what that means is uh, they haven't declined, but they look at things like uh, the average weekly hours of manufacturing or the initial claims for unemployment insurance or building permits. So it's all these kind of like very lead indicators because you know, building permits is an interesting one because housing makes up 17% of the GDP. So it's, it's stuff that kind of drives the economy. So he's saying they're not all up yet. And what that tells me is that we've still got a run here before you start to see like pricing and things go the other way. However, you got to look at rates and what your acquisition cost is going to be too and the quality of the offer. And I think that's the thing that sellers need to be cognizant of because you might get into that really invasive inspection process, which we haven't seen for about two years. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, I was in a couple of situations this weekend where we had accepted an offer with inspections. So people can still get their inspections. Um, it just depends on, you know, each, each house, mm -hmm. each individual deal. Agreed. But there are still a lot of situations where it is waiving everything. Pretty much waiving everything and going so well what, over what, what is everything very quickly? That would be waiving your mortgage contingency. So uh, whether you're coming in paying all cash or just waiving the contingency. It's confident in your ability to get approved. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, throwing, you know, waiving the appraisal 
contingency. So there's no whatever the whatever the appraised value is, you're going to cover. You're it. buying the house. You're buying the house for X amount of dollars, whatever that offer price is, and waiving all the inspections. You know, people were trying to waive the HOA document. It's illegal. You can't <laughs> it's do illegal, that. Illegal, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that came to a screeching halt. Right, right. <laughs> but there was a period of time people were doing that, and I was like, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> gotta love realtors. But, I mean, yeah. I give them credit for you know trying to get the house. I mean, but, it's, just, but you know, gotta know the law. It all. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. All right. So what we're seeing here is this labor shortage not really affecting the market. It looks like there are some headwinds of a recession. We're not quite there yet, and it doesn't. Based on the data we have, I don't see it affecting the housing market. Like a lot of people think. So Mm -hmm. what we'll what we're going to do, we're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We got Doug Kahn here from Unruh Turner, Burke uh, and Freeze, an amazing law firm in the local market here. We're going to talk about all things estates, how they can help you protect your assets. This is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. You shouldn't have to deal with all the red tape when getting your mortgage from a big or online bank. At Mortgage America, we have access to big bank money, but with the personalized and detailed service of a local bank. We are here in your community and ready to serve with fast settlements, low down payment options, and first-time homebuyer programs. Pre-approval is free, no costs or commitments. For more information, visit our website at mymortgageamerica.com or give us a call at 610-439-8000. Mortgage America is the Tom Tool Sales Group is the number one REMAX team in Pennsylvania with over $165 million in volume for 2021. I'm Tom Tool, and our team has achieved that kind of success by being a great place to work with and to work for. No one knows Greater Philly better than we do. We know real estate, but more importantly, we're real people. We hire the best agents, and we give them all the tools to succeed. Even our brand new agents sell 17 to 24 homes a year because our team delivers the best experience in real estate. Teams deliver a better experience than individuals, and we're a top 1% real estate team in the country. We call it AAA service. We're your advocate, ally, and advisor. Because this isn't a transaction to us. It's a relationship. If you're buying or selling a home, call the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Main Line at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. That's Tom, tool with an E, dot com. Sell your home for more and remember the real estate golden rule. You always get more when you work with Tom Tool. Have you considered a career in real estate? Do you want control over your income? Whether you have a license or not, call us today at 610-692-6976 or visit TomTool.com. Join our team, the Tom Tool Sales Group at REMAX Main Line. Buying a home or already own one? We can help. I am Kevin Hamill from Alliances Insurance Agency. If you haven't reviewed your policies in the last three years, now's the time. New home buyers, there are a number of ways that we can help you get to that settlement table. Call us to find out more at 610-816-0043, extension 3, or visit our website, alliancesinsurance.com. Don't forget the S, it's for savings. All right, all right, all right. We are back on Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. I'm Tom Tool. She's Sarah Time and she's Stacy Mitchell. We've got Gabe behind the camera, and the four of us work for the Tom Tool Sales Group, the number one Remax team in Pennsylvania since 2018. And we've got special guest, estate attorney extraordinaire Doug Kahn here with Unruh Turner Burke and Freeze. You want to get in touch with him and his firm? You can call him at 610 933 8069. Or visit their website, paestateplanners.com. Doug, thanks for coming on, man. We're excited to chat with you a bit. Thanks, Tom. It's great to be here. So, um, full disclosure, Doug has done my estate paperwork, so obviously I, I have a lot of, lot of trust there. Uh, what we were kind of talking about before the break was that I don't think a lot of people understand how this relates to real estate and the importance of getting your estate in order, kind of having that stuff all done properly so why don't you give us a little bit of background first, and then maybe you can kind of talk a little bit about why it's almost like a must if you're a homeowner to be talking with someone like yourself. Sure. Um, I guess a little bit about myself. I'm Philadelphia native, grown up in the uh, western suburbs, so tried and true Philadelphian. I'm uh, married with three kids. I've got uh, three boys that keep me uh, active and, <laughs> and uh, engaged at all times. They're Either climbing all around on top of me, throwing me down, or uh, got me out on the ball fields playing uh, sports. So it's a great time. Um, I'm a managing partner at the uh, law firm of Unreturner Burke and Freeze. Uh, head up the estate um, 
uh, practice. And uh, we have offices in Phoenixville and Westchester. And uh, we meet with clients regularly on their estate planning needs and also uh, helping them out at the time a loved one passes away to handle estate administrations or trust administrations. Um, So, you know, we get to see all kinds of interesting things as it relates to real estate. So, uh, you know, the pitfalls that people fall into um, when they don't realize some of the things that are going on as it relates to the real estate in the family. So it's a natural uh, asset of most people. So, you know, we deal with it regularly, helping clients to make sure that the uh, real estate is titled properly, um, making sure that they're aware of uh, any titling defects before, um, uh, you know, they transfer the real estate to family members or, um, you know, before they pass it along through a will or other estate planning vehicle, making sure that uh, they have it teed up the way they need it to be. So what what are some of the common mistakes you see people make? Like they buy, I mean, besides like not having a will, I think that's probably number one, but Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But, but I mean, I, I don't think a lot of people get this. They buy a house and they kind of say, great, they move in. And they don't think about, like, what happens if someone passes. Or uh, this is a common thing that, that I, I, I get a little concerned about for clients. Most, uh, the biggest and most common mistake that I see is um, actually where the titling is uh, in one name for a husband and wife situation. And uh, clients don't realize that uh, over time, you know, they uh, – basically forget or, uh, you know, we have a lot of situations where maybe husband or wife owned the real estate before the marriage and they just leave the property titled in the one name. And then uh, subsequently, uh, the person who owns the property passes away and uh, the property is uh, expected to transfer automatically to that surviving Uh. spouse. And, um, you know, it, it by law, may not actually transfer entirely to the surviving spouse, especially if there are children of the marriage or children from a prior marriage may transfer to, um, at least in part, to um, the children of the decedent and uh, not entirely to the surviving spouse. So that's one thing that we really are cognizant of as we're meeting with clients, making sure that they let us know how all of their real estate is titled, uh, make sure that uh, if they expect it to be own jointly that it in fact is. So we check all the deeds, uh, review those with the clients, and make sure if they aren't titled that way that we update the deeds and uh, make sure that the joint ownership is refre- uh, reflected properly. So let's talk about taxes because I think that's like a, like an inheritance tax, estate tax. Like I, I think that that concerns a lot of people. Stacey, you just went through this a little bit with your own family. I mean, I, I just I don't think people get the tax consequences of this. So what what are some of the things people need to think about when they're estate planning to avoid paying more taxes than they absolutely have to? Because that's everyone's like nightmare scenario. So I think it's important to just give you a little bit of background on the tax systems at at the time somebody passes away. Pennsylvania, the state has an inheritance tax. Um, And uh, the tax rate is dependent on who uh, the assets are being left to and how they're related to the person who passed away. Uh, So I can give you a little bit of a rundown there. Anything that you transfer to your spouse has a zero tax. Anything that you transfer to your children is taxed at 4.5%. Anything that you transfer to a uh, sibling, so brother, sister, is 12%. And anything that goes to a niece, nephew, aunt, uncle, friend, or extended family member is 15%. And anything that goes to a charity is uh, also a zero uh, tax rate. There is no exemption for the Pennsylvania inheritance tax. So that tax begins at dollar one. Uh, There are very few exempted assets, one of which is life insurance transferring to uh, beneficiaries. Uh, Another one would be um, on the real estate front real estate that's owned outside of the state of Pennsylvania. So if you have a vacation home in Florida or New Jersey or wherever else, uh, those uh, pieces of real estate will be taxed based on their location and not on uh, Pennsylvania inheritance tax. So, um, you know, those are the tax rates for Pennsylvania. Generally speaking, that's kind of the lower echelon tax as we're doing planning for clients. There is also a federal estate tax um, system. It just so happens that presently the federal estate tax uh, exemption is at an all-time high, $12,060,000 
per person. So if you have a husband and wife, they have the ability to shelter over $24 million of assets before they start to pay the federal estate tax on assets that are transferred to children or other loved ones. Um, that tax planning is particularly important because the tax rate is so high. Every dollar over the threshold for the federal estate tax is 40% taxed. So that's a huge one. And so for the particularly wealthy clients, uh, we're working on all kinds of new and interesting uh, estate planning <laughs> techniques to help to avoid a 40% tax, as you could imagine. Wow. It's also worth noting that the present law is set to expire at the end of 2025. And if that happens, and so all that has to happen is the government just lets it ride. We get to the end of 2025. On January 21 of 2026, the exemption will be approximately one half of what it is today. It'll wow. be just over $6 million per person. So the threshold for a married couple at that point would be $12 million instead of the 24 that it is now. And uh, it's still slated to be the same 40% tax rate. So we could have a you know, bigger uh, tax burden uh, for the taxpayer if that occurs. Wow. wow. Yeah. It's a, lot, it's a lot of money. Yeah, and you guys are talking a lot <laughs> yeah. about the uh, escalating values of real estate. And uh, that certainly plays a key factor in what we're doing because we're monitoring uh, our clients' net worth, obviously. And as the properties are going up in value, I'm sure that uh, each of you have clients that not only have local properties, but I mean, the New Jersey Shore property is probably the greatest example for us here mm -hmm. because we see people with homes uh, along the shoreline that are going up 30, 40, 50 percent in value. So they're, uh, you know, half their net worth is in a New Jersey Shore property, you know. So uh, we watch those closely and make sure that those assets are included in the planning and, um, you know, we're vigilant to make sure that those are transferring in a way that will be tax advantaged because a lot of those families would like for the real estate to continue to pass along within the family. Uh, but you could imagine if their estate is large enough and if this uh, real estate's caught up in it, they might have 40% tax and might not be able to hold on to it right. because of the tax. Mm -hmm. Now, would you say for in Pennsylvania, the different rates for transferring to, you know, your spouse, children, nieces, is that higher or lower than what you see in many other states? So Pennsylvania, you'll if you ever kind of do one of the old searches online, Pennsylvania is one of the few states that has an inheritance tax. And that can be a little bit misleading in that uh, many states have an estate tax. So they differentiate those things. And the real main difference is that an inheritance tax, it has its own separate system uh, based on Pennsylvania law, whereas the estate tax is really a decoupled um, extension of the federal estate tax. So usually you'll see for these other states that they'll have an exemption where there's an estate tax, but the exemption will be significantly lower than the federal level. So you might have a federal exemption of twelve million and sixty thousand, but another state might have an exemption of only two million. And for every dollar over the two million, the estate's taxed at fifteen percent as an example. So I would say that Pennsylvania is probably in the middle of the pack. There are certainly some states that have no federal estate tax, or excuse me, no estate tax and no inheritance tax whatsoever. And then there are others that have an estate tax and uh, if your estate is small enough, it may not be impacted by that estate tax because of the threshold that they've set. But if you have a bigger, wealthier, uh, bigger estate with a wealthier client, uh, and every dollar over two million is taxed at fifteen percent, suddenly their tax rate is going to be significantly higher than Pennsylvania's. Okay. Yeah. So it's really diverse out there uh, from state to state. <clears throat> And we definitely have clients who are uh, kind of uh, surveying that issue because, you know, if they've got the multi multiple jurisdiction real estate there, uh, it's not uncommon for them to decide, I'm going to make Florida, as an example, uh, their state of residence, uh, because that would allow them to avoid Pennsylvania's inheritance tax. And if Florida doesn't have any kind of a state tax at that point, uh, they could come out ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. 
tax law. I mean, it's uh, it's complicated, but yeah, it's it's, yeah. it's costly. So uh, you want to get in touch with Doug at 610-933-8069 or visit www.paestateplanners.com. I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. So what what would be the someone needs some estate help? Like, like what's your process like? I, I know you guys make it very easy. Why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I think people hear this and get scared, but sure. it's often a lot easier than than than, than folks think. Yeah. Because uh, all that we do out of my office is the estate work, um, you know, it's, I think, a little bit easier on the client. Uh, we very systematized, uh, so I could really walk you through uh, what, what it looks like for a client from start to finish. Usually it uh, starts with a phone call or an email, and they're getting in touch with us just to let us know that they're interested in getting together to talk about their planning. Uh, someone in our staff will schedule an appointment um, you know, within a few weeks of uh, that initial call. And we'll send out a confidential estate planning questionnaire, usually ask the clients to fill that out in detail and pass it back to us before the initial meeting. That gives me an opportunity to take a look, go over things a little bit before I meet with a client, get an understanding of what's there um, and some issue spotting so I can be better prepared to uh, make that initial meeting efficient. And then we'll uh, sit down, go over the estate planning questionnaire together. Uh, I'll kind of glean from a client the things that are most important for them, uh, make some suggestions, usually give them three or four uh, recommendations, give them an opportunity to decide what kind of planning they would like to utilize after uh, we have that full discussion. And once we make that determination, we'll schedule a, a future meeting and uh, kind of get the go-ahead to begin the planning process, prepare draft documents. We send them out to the client. They have an opportunity to review them, uh, talk about them together as, uh, you know, either as a husband and wife or as an individual with their family. And then we'll have a targeted date to sit down, go over the documents together in detail. And usually at that uh, second meeting, we're able to review, sign, and have the documents um, finalized. And then we have a few uh, follow-up points after the signing. Uh, One of the most important things that clients um, may not really think about uh, as a part of the planning process is making sure that the beneficiary designations uh, on various assets are updated. So IRAs and 401ks Mm -hmm. are dealt with as well. Great stuff, Doug. So, again, you want to get in touch with Doug, it's www.paestateplanners.com, 610-933-8069. You want to follow Stacy? she's on Instagram, at the number two Mitchco. Sarah's at Ty underscore Ty Time. You can follow me at TomTool, 3RD. And this is Tool Time Real Estate Radio on WWDB 860 AM. We'll be back next week.